Hear the holy roar of God beside me. I need to make real quick. One of our former members from several years ago, Maria Faulkner, I don't know how many remember her or remember them. Anyway, her daughter sent a message and then she has been having some medical issues and she's home now, but she goes back tomorrow to the hospital for a procedure they're gonna do on her and she just asked that we pray for her. So if you, can please pray for her. Anita Roden is in the hospital. She's in room 460, having a lot of back pain, so just need to remember her. And a couple of quick announcements. Young at Heart Potluck game and dinner night is tomorrow, so come and enjoy the night together. And in the foyer, you can sign up for men's breakfast. It's April the 4th. So sign up for the men's breakfast if you can be here. It's always a good, good fellowship time together. And usually always a good meal. I think that's really all that I had to make. Oh, I did talk to, uh, and Grayson is doing a lot better. And so he's thinking about trying to go to school tomorrow, but I'm not for sure if that'll happen or not. But. He is improving and they're managing the pain and so he is doing really well so we're proud of that so continue to pray, pray for Grayson. If you will bow we will pray and 
Father, we thank you again for the day. And Father, we thank you so much for the beauty of this day. The sunshine, Father, looks so good. And we're so thankful to you for all the things that you bless us with every day. Father, we ask that you be with us as we begin our time of worship together. And Father, that we can continue to to look to you for strength and courage when we need. I, Father, I continue that we continue to pray for Grace and Gage, and Father, that we pray for Marie Faulkner, Anita Roden, and Father, we have all our other members and stuff that are sick that are listed in the bulletin, and check the bulletin for those, and Father, that we continue to lift each one of them up every day. Father, I ask that you be with us now as we worship together. For all this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Just sing with me with these next two songs. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will see. Of the goodness of God. Oh, my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life, All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness. Known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness of God. Oh, my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life, All my life you have been so. is running after, it's running after me, your goodness is running after, it's running after me, your goodness is running after, it's running after me, with my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Yes. 
You may be seated. Thank you. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, amazing grace. All day long, Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never Oh, 
Come thou precious Prince of Peace, here your bride to you we sing. Come thou fount of our blessing. <laughs> Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? begin. Take me away my burden, setting my spirit free for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty holy sea.
when thinking about this morning's time. And what I began to think about is uh, how unique shared experiences can be in the way that they form us and form relationships with people. And I started to think about uh, sort of the different types of shared experiences that we have uh, and that have bonded us to certain people. And oftentimes, there's not any other reason that we would come together or have a bond with someone else other than maybe this shared experience. Um, one of the first ones that came to mind, and ironically, I stand in front of a group where I grew up with several of you, is just growing up together. There are people that I'm friends with today and have a really strong bond simply because our parents were friends and thus we grew up together. And after having spent that much time together, there's a certain level of bond there. Would we have picked each other as friends? I don't know. But our parents were friends and so we spent time together and so there was a bond that was developed. There are other types of shared experiences. You might go on an adventure or a trip together. Sometimes a perilous trip or adventure where something goes wrong and uh, you have to struggle through things. And that sort of forms this shared experience that tends to bond people together. My grandfather served in World War II, and I remember growing up that the group that fought together always they had a yearly reunion where they all got back together all the way up until they passed away and after having gone through something as horrendous as a war it bonded them and again they were from different places and different cultures and different families and different ways of life but that shared experience bonded them in a way that they were driven to continue to have a reunion every year until most of them passed away. So shared experiences can be extremely powerful in the way that they bring us together. And communion is one of those. It's set up to be a shared experience. We are all doing it together here this morning. But perhaps even more powerful, there are people all over the world doing the same thing. I spent some time the, I guess the year that we had gotten married, um, we spent some time with some missionary friends of ours in Togo, West Africa. And Togo was a different country than the United States, very different. 
Everything looked different, felt different, smelled different. It was not home to me. I was in a foreign land, for sure. The primary religion there was voodoo, which is something of storybooks to most of us, but there it was very real. And so if you came across someone who claimed Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God, you were buddies. I don't remember discussing much about the particulars of any of my buddies in Togo, their religious stances on things. I just remember, oh, we're, we have a bond. It was clear we had a bond. They served the God that I served, and they held the Messiah that I held. And that was enough to bond us. And I think what we do in our worship service, stopping to remember Christ's sacrifice, his body and the blood, is a bonding experience and should be seen as that, not just for ourselves and what we do, but the fact that other people are partaking in that. And those are our brothers and sisters, a part of something bigger than ourselves. So, I'm going to pray twice, and as we first take of the bread, and then of the cup, I want you to ponder the significance of it as an event, but I also want you to consider the significance that it is a shared event with others who make the same claim as us and how that brings us together and how that bonds each of us. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning pausing to reflect and remember and to value the time that you've set aside to do that. the sacrifice that Christ made for us and the difference it makes in our life and the significance that that is. Help us to not forget that, but for that to be the driver behind everything that we do. We thank you for his willingness to do that and for the fact that it reconciles us to you. It's in his name that we pray, amen. Let's pray again. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for sending your Son to sacrifice for us so that we can be with you and be reconciled to you. We thank you for his willingness to suffer and to shed his blood for us and help us to keep at the forefront of our minds what that means in everyday life to us and to others around us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>
why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a holy birth? Because he loved me so. standing before Jared brings our lesson this morning. <clears throat> How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into and through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope, who could imagine? could fathom such, such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings called Out of the 
silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are my living hope. Be seated. God is good, amen. God is good, amen. So we're just going to jump right into it. The next three weeks, I want to look at Christ's death, his, his burial, and his resurrection. I want, I want to amplify certain aspects that take place during those moments. During, during the moment where Jesus is on the cross, during that time in which there was this, this weight of this burial, waiting and anticipating a resurrection or maybe the thought of wondering if there would be one, and then focusing then on the resurrection, the empty tomb, what sets Jesus apart from everyone else, conquering death. And so as we begin this morning, let's go ahead and dive into Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Paul, throughout different writings to churches, he is fixated on the cross. He is fixated on, on the idea and the concept of what takes place on the cross, the crucifixion, the, the journey to the cross. He, he sits in it for quite some time. In Corinthians, he, he says, while I was with you, I just wanted to focus only and in and through the crucifixion, through the cross. That's what I really wanted to focus on with you guys, to a hurting congregation, he wanted to amplify this image of Jesus, the Messiah on the cross. And here in Philippians, as he's going to encourage them, a group of people who are anticipating persecution, are anticipating troubled times, he gives them this encouragement, and it's an encouragement of a message about the cross. Let's pick up in verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset of, of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in an appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death, the death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him in the high place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Go back again to verse 8. And being, being found in the appearance of man, he humbled, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. As I sat 
in this, this moment of death on the cross, I, I reflected and remembered a friend of mine sharing with me a scripture that I had not really seen before. He, he shared this with me a couple of years ago, and it's found in Luke chapter 9. Go to Luke chapter 9. Because when I think about death on the cross, now I think about Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Where Luke is, is sharing in his gospel a journey that Jesus has taken. But in verse 51 it says, At the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. That Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Some translations will say that Jesus turned his face towards Jerusalem, set his eyes towards Jerusalem. Jesus looked with intent, with determination towards Jerusalem. What's in Jerusalem? The cross. Is there waiting for him in Jerusalem? And as I think of that image of Jesus here in, in this ministry, in the moments and kind of in the middle of his ministry, he's with his people, his, his disciples, he's been doing miracles, he's been teaching, he's been predicting his death. He gazes all of his intentions or attention towards Jerusalem. He fixes his face. He resolutely turns towards the place where he's going to hang on the cross. And as I think about that, I think of this idea of him being on the cross just didn't happen by accident, right? That there was some deep intention that went, went on, that Jesus de desperately decided to go towards the cross. But as I look at Jesus' life, I don't really think this is the only time, I don't feel or believe that this is the only time that Jesus resolutely set his attention towards Jerusalem, that he set his face towards the cross. Can I see that through everything that Jesus did, that he was purposely looking towards Jerusalem, towards the cross, and all things he did. I mean, take the temptations in the desert. Where Jesus, before he begins his ministry, he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights and he's there in the desert and Satan approaches him and, and he's led to this, this interaction between him and, Jesus, or him and Satan and Satan starts to then tempt him. He hasn't ate for 40 days and I know I would be ready for some food after 40 days. And Satan looks at him and says, hey, Take these stones. See these stones? Take these stones and, and turn them into bread because you are hungry after all, right? And then in this moment, Jesus is being tempted. And as I think about that, and I think of he's setting his face towards Jerusalem. He's setting his attention towards the cross. Why does he say no? Because that's what he's trying to accomplish. It's setting his face towards Jerusalem, towards the cross. So he says no why, though? Because all Satan is asking him to do is do a little miracle to produce food, right? And Jesus will eventually do miracles that produce food. Feeding of the multitude. But what's different about this time? What's different about this place and this situation? Well, Satan is trying to get Jesus to use his power to take care of his own self, his own self-indulgence. Satan is trying to get his gaze off of the cross, off of Jerusalem, and turning in on his own needs and his own desires of the flesh in that moment. And Jesus responds and steps back and says, no, that's not where my attention is. I'm not going to use my power for my personal benefit. That's not where I'm going. Then, then Satan says, hey, Let's go up to this high place. Throw yourselves off, throw yourself off and, 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 and command that, that the angels and, and will, will take care of you and you won't be harmed and show and prove that, that God is with you and prove that God will take care of you. Prove that you're the Son of Man. In this moment, it seems like the temptation that Satan is trying to do is get him to use his power and his 
position to prove, to prove where he sits with God. He's trying to get his power to prove his position of where he sits with God. And then the next one. All right, Jesus. If you want to have authority over all the nations, if you want to be able to command them and and guide them and tell them and teach them and and direct them and, and be in charge of them, if you want to lead them, I've got the way. All you have to do is bow down to me. Bow down to me. And I'll give you authority over all the nations. The temptation seems to be that he's trying to get Jesus to take his eyes off of Jerusalem, off of the cross, and work with Satan himself on being seated in a position of authority. And Jesus denies that. Jesus takes takes these moments of power and position and and authority, and he's even saying, and and you want to be glorified? You want to be lifted up? Just all you got to do is bow down to me. And so Jesus, again, he takes his eyes and he turns them towards Jerusalem. He set his face towards the cross. He didn't use his position or his power for himself, but he denied himself in those moments. And as I think about Jesus sitting on the cross, I think of what it would have been like to be one of those followers or those people in the crowd as I saw Jesus being lifted up on this cross. I probably reflect back on on just moments earlier, just not too long ago, I saw Jesus riding in on a young colt, right? And we were throwing down our coats thinking the king has come. Praise Hosanna. Praise God. Blessed is the king that's coming here. And I would be thinking, wait a minute. I thought this was going to be a king that led us out of the oppression of the Roman Empire. I thought this was going to be a king that led us into victory, into into this war, into this battle here on this earth where we would win and we would conquer and we would be free. I'd probably be sitting there looking up at the cross with a little disappointment. Right? Because I'd lay down my coat as he rode this young colt into this this city, thinking he's coming here to conquer. Or if I'm John, I'm sitting there next to Jesus' mother. And as I gaze up at the cross, I see him hanging there between two thieves. And I reflect back on the conversation that I had with him earlier where where I and James said, hey, why don't you let one of us sit on your left and one of you sit on the right? In other words, give us a, a, a place of position, a place of power, a place of authority. Let us be there with you. And I would reflect on that moment as I saw the one who I'd been following for quite some time asking him for that position of power, prestige. And I would reflect on that and think, man, Jesus was right when he said, I don't know what I'm asking. And there would be this despair because we were looking for a king. A king that might could storm Caesar's palace. A king that could, that could, could conquer just like Our ancestors were looking for a king to conquer, to rule, because all the other nations had him. So we need one too. And as I looked at the cross, that kind of king would fade away. As ministers, we get to share stories of our children that are quite embarrassing. I grew up as a preacher's kid, so I understand that. Right now, my son is probably kind of getting a little uncomfortable because of that statement. But I'm not going to share a story of my children being kind of in an embarrassing moment. I'm going to share a a story of when I was a child that's kind of embarrassing. 
I can remember being around 10, 11 years old. And I sat in the, in the pew at West Milton Church of Christ, and, and we had just built a new building. It was, it was the octagon. It was round, all right? And all the classrooms were on the outside of it. But it kind of came to a, a center point where up in, the, up in the ceiling there was windows that kind of surrounded this round spot in the ceiling. And as my dad preached, even though I pretended to pay attention, I was, I was daydreaming, all right? I would sit over there and I would daydream. And one of the things that kind of kept coming up in my daydreams was what if, through that skylight, ninjas started coming down? (laughs) What would I do? Now, I don't know if you know this, but the panhandle of Florida has had a ninja problem. But as I sat there, I would think about that. I'm sure it probably had something to do with the Ninja Turtles coming out in the early 90s, right? And I would think I would, I would go to town. At 10 years old, 11 years old, I would protect everybody in the room from the falling ninjas from the ceiling, right? There's something that's kind of woven into our minds at times of being the hero. Like, we desire to watch movies that have a hero in it. We ourselves desire at times to be the hero. I was not allowed to watch Rocky when I was a child growing up if I was at home alone with my older sister. There was something that would just kick in where I became Rocky, the hero of the story, and she became Mr. T, all right? And so I would get a little violent because I was the hero In this book by Brian Zahn, A Beauty Will Save the World, he talks about this idea of how we've lost beauty. That beauty has been replaced with with power and prestigeness, and we've lost beauty. And one of the things that we've lost beauty in is that the, the saint has been replaced with the hero. That the hero is, is the one that we kind of look to and we desire, like John Wayne, like who can shoot the fastest, who can fight the, the best. He goes into a town where, where the bad guys are now uh, corrupting the leadership. They're, the sheriff is corrupted, his deputies are corrupted, and, and he comes in with his gun and his, and his tobacco and he's able to spit further than anybody or further, or he can spit in a more longer distance than everyone else, all right? Can't ever remember if it's further or father. But he, he amplifies this idea of conquering, of power. And we kind of get memorized by that, right? And we fall into the struggle of replacing beauty with power. That we think if we can get the right person in the right position with the right power to create the, the right policies, then everything will be perfect. Now you're thinking, man, Jared probably worked all of Thursday on that sentence. No, just 10 minutes. But we do. We think if we can get the right person with the right kind of power and place them in the right position and have them create the the right policies, then everything will be perfect. It will work out in our favor. And we desire, we desire for that power to produce something good, but we fall into that trap. And we begin to start looking like all the kings of Israel who were called to be leaders but time and time again, started looking at their own desires, their own hunger for bread, their own desire to lead the people in the way that they saw fit. And we fall into this trap of, of sin, which leads others into it as well. Brian Zahn says this, that Christ persuades, not by the force of Caesar, but by the beauty of love. That when Jesus turned his face towards Jerusalem, when he looked towards the cross, 
when he set his face towards the crucifix. That Jesus was persuading not by force of Caesar, but by the beauty of love. Go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 21 and on. Peter has just declared, has just proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus is this, or it goes on. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell anyone. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to all of them. Whoever wants to be my disciple, he must deny them, they must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. But whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow them. Take up their cross. He says this before he himself is on the cross. This Roman custom of, of carrying the crossbar through the streets was a proclamation that you were convicted of something. It was a, it was a sign of humu- humiliation, not of power, but of lowliness. And Jesus says to his disciples, if you want to follow me, it's not about power and position. It's not about authority. But it's about humiliation. It's about being humbled. It's about being convicted. Convicted of what? Of living like Christ and following his ways. He says, I want you, I want you to take up your cross daily. The cross is a measurement of love. And it's more beautiful than believing in the power It's beautiful because it's believing in the power of love, not the love of power. And so our our call is when we look at the cross, that we're to live that too. That we're not to fall into the trap of of if I could get in this position and have this power to be able to to put in these policies, then everything's going to work out. It's a matter of if I can humble myself if I can sacrifice, if I can turn my gaze towards Jerusalem, if I can fix my eyes on the cross. Hebrews, writer writes, he says, I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus. I want you to fix your eyes on Christ, who endured the cross. The cross. So the cross reminds me that in a moment's where I'm tempted to think I've got to make something work out of pure power and authority and make things right out of that, that just maybe in that moment I might need to deny myself, that I might need to lower myself, that I might need to humble myself because that's what Christ did. And as those followers and Different people were sitting there looking up at the cross. Not doing everything right. Some of his followers had, had kind of deserted him and withdrew back out of fear. I bet they got word kind of instantly of what was going up there. I imagine they were sending messengers back and forth. Please let us know what's taking place. What's happening? And I bet the moment that they got word of the things that Jesus said on the cross, it struck something deep within them. Especially the moment where he's sitting there in all humility at the people who were mocking him and yelling at him, the people who have put him up on the cross. And he looks out and he says, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And when we don't do what's right, and we fall into the temptation of power and prestige and authority, 
Jesus still says, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. If you have any need this morning, please come as we stand and we sing. Hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. Bob with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me God, we recognize what a great price was paid for our adoption into your family. And God, we praise you. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus on that cross, which we look to resolutely this morning. God, we pray for humility that we might be able to take up that cross daily as we leave from this place. Help us to be a light to this world around us. Help us to serve others. Help us to unify under the name and banner of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.